Transmission start. Welcome to Where Did the Road Go? Join us as we wander off the path and explore lost history, consciousness, the paranormal, unexplained mysteries, alternative thought, and much more. We are present on the web at wheredidtheroadgo.com. Now here is your host, Soraya. So I am joined once again by Mr. Micah Hanks. It's been a while, Micah. Yeah, you say once again, but yeah, I was thinking it may have been more than a year since um, I've joined you on your show. We had you on the Graylian Report one night, and um, boy, that was fun because it was with your regular weekly co-hosts, uh, Red Pill Junkie and Joshua Cutchin. So mm-hmm. all four of us together, it almost turned things upside down, and uh, <laughs> that was a lot of fun, always is. And, hey, glad to be back. All right, and uh, I was thinking, since it's one of your favorite subjects and we've never dealt with this idea on, on, on this show, as, at least as far as I can remember, that we, maybe we talk a little bit about the possibility of time travel. I don't know if I've got the time to get into that subject. <laughs> oh. Wait, let me, ask you, let me ask you, who told you that I liked time travel, huh? I, I believe it was you. See what I did there? Hmm? <sighs> You were, I, I know at one point you were thinking about writing a book about it, and you said you're still, it's in, in the possible plans for the future. Yeah, well, I mean, in this case, a book about time travel would have to be in the future, or in the past, or, <laughs> uh, you know what I'm saying. You see, this this is one of those things, it's, uh, it's one of those subjects that can get kind of uh, wibbly-wobbly at times, but see, <laughs> I can't even make a joke about time without actually referencing temporality, so. No, it is an interesting subject to me, though, and yeah, uh, in the future... I do actually plan to try and expound on this. I own, I would say, most of the good scientific literature as far as popular books that have been written about uh, time travel. I actually own, uh, I would say, the majority of them. Paul Davies wrote a great, very kind of um, Spartan analysis called How to Build a Time Machine a few years ago that I really loved, and it got me interested in J. Richard Gott and uh, the, the research of a number of other people. Uh, and so I own a lot of different books. But, you know, the first person who really inspired me to take an interest in time and temporality and the relationship between uh, really entropy and the thermodynamic arrow of time and how that affects human memory and human perception in general, I have to give the credit to uh, Sir Stephen Hawking for that because there's a brilliant chapter in A Brief History of Time called The Thermodynamic Arrow of Time, which I was very sad to see that when they did this kind of updated and condensed version of the book called A Briefer History of Time, it's also still a very worthy read, but it's a simpler version, I think, for the modern reader. Go back and get the original, A Brief History of Time, because they omit that chapter about the thermodynamic arrow of time and the nature of the way that the human mind and memory function in relation to entropy and thermodynamic laws. So, you know, there is a thermodynamic component to this, I think that's very important. I was sad that they removed that chapter because it didn't seem relevant, I guess, to the broader simplified notion of what space and time and reality all are here in the cosmos. But yeah, so Stephen Hawking absolutely was formative in getting me interested in all this. And having spoken about it a lot over the years, that may have been, I've never thought about this before, Soraya, but um, I would go to conferences and be giving lectures and talking about time and its relationship with perception and memory. And um, maybe that was one of the reasons people began first saying to me, you remind me, Micah, of the doctor. Hmm. I had no idea who the doctor was, and I'd always respond in turn. I would say, doctor who? <laughs> I said, yeah, exactly. And it's funny because I was, I was just uh, having a wonderful email exchange with an English school teacher immediately before I did this interview with you. And she was referencing that. She said, you know, Micah, you can be the doctor who says you can't. You are the doctor in my mind. You know, was that to me? Who am I yet to find myself to be? And it is kind of funny how these weird little archetypal kind of representations that reappear in various myth and 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 cultural references and historical references and popular fiction and things throughout history that we do find aspects of ourselves in those in those characters, or people find them for you if you're not willing to look. So yeah, and that brings us. Full circle, yeah, it all kind of culminated in a legitimate interest and a serious scientific interest in time travel. And so to begin at the end, let me say here at the outset, and then we'll move forward from behind. (laughs) To me, time travel is more than just a hypothetical possibility. I think it is a reality that can be hypothetically demonstrated in a number of different generic uh, uh, 
situations in keeping with general relativity theory. Uh, there are a number of different ways that it can occur, and uh, and therefore most scientists agree that time travel is a theoretical reality, but it in likelihood is something that would be very difficult, if not nearly impossible, to actualize. And I would think one of the arguments against time travel is if we ever invented a time machine, wouldn't we know? You would think, but see, one of the interesting things about uh, the hypothetical construction of a time machine is that the time machine would allow travel back in time, but only as far back as the point after which the time machine itself had been created. So in theory, mm. yes, in theory, if we ever create a time machine, according to that model, then we would be able to know whether it worked because that would be the point in history uh, to which our future time travelers could return. But what's, again, I think that what we have to at least be open-minded enough to consider here is the possibility that that is based on our own limited knowledge of the universe. Uh, and if indeed we are limited enough in the scope of the reality as we understand it, because you've got to keep in mind, a scientific, a good scientific theory uh, uses a basic, you know, kind of a fundamental approach, a fairly simple uh, set of, of logical rules, observations, based on observations of the universe, in order to predict a wide array of different kind of phenomena. Relativity is able to do that. Relativity is is complex, but if you read the book Relativity that Einstein wrote, actually it's kind of a series of essays, he was able to simplify the concepts in such a way that anybody could really sit down, and if you apply a little bit of thought to it, anybody could sit down and really understand what he was getting at. And these fundamental aspects of reality are easily understood, I think, because they are fundamentally simple. They do apply to the everyday, and yet, with, with maybe the exception of Sir Isaac Newton, whose theory at that time was incomplete, it was made more complete due to the observations and the and the thought and the work, and yes, the mathematics that uh, was required to do that, that, that Einstein applied. But even general relativity, despite the wide array of phenomena that it predicts, it doesn't give us a complete picture of the universe, especially on the quantum level. And so... When it comes to time travel, it is at least possible that there are aspects of the universe that in our incomplete picture, in terms of trying to explain all that we can see and experience and observe, that maybe there are some things that we've missed. And at some point further on down the road, there will be individuals in the future, presumably, who will be able to overcome those kinds of hurdles. And, um, and even the late Carl Sagan had speculated, I mean, it could be that and he was saying this, if memory serves, it was at least edited on this program a few years ago so as to appear that he was saying this in direct contrast to something that Stephen Hawking had said. Hawking said that he thought that if there were, if there were any kind of evidence of time travel, the time travelers, like you said, Soraya, would have come back already, they would have been here, we would know, and therefore time travel doesn't exist. And then Sagan says, I find that argument fairly dubious. He says it could be that time travel exists, but that we observe certain phenomena which we mistake for something else. He said, for all we know, ghosts are UFOs, and he actually named those two things. He said ghosts are UFOs may be representative of these time travelers in the future, and it could be that the evidence exists, but we are misinterpreting it today as something else. Sure. So, I mean, that you know maybe is more of a thought experiment than an, uh, a statement that Sagan would have intended people to take literally, but, I mean, it is nonetheless a hypothetical that should be considered, I think. And so, yeah, there is a possibility that there are ways that people would get around our current limited knowledge of time travel and how a hypothetical time machine might be built, and they may be able to come back to the present day. But it, will we recognize that technology as such? It might also be that if you go back in time, you create a new universe. <laughs> there, there are any number of things that that yes. could entail. So, so our universe wouldn't see it, but you know, another probable universe would have time travelers. Yeah, the general idea is that um, if traveling, th th this, well, I, th I think what you're getting at specifically is is uh, a hypothetical solution to what was called the grandfather paradox. That's probably yeah. the most famous of the paradoxes. And, and in addition to a book about time travel, maybe it would be better just to do an entire chapter about paradoxes. But the paradoxes within time travel, I, I almost thought that a book of, of thought experiments, paradoxes, and... Um, and seemingly impossible circumstances would be a great book into itself. You know, the, the, just looks at hypothetical paradoxes in science. But again, the grandfather paradox does relate to time travel. And for those who may not be familiar with it, it's quite simple. It's just the notion that, well, if you travel from this point in the present day back in time and you kill your grandfather, then you would cease to exist. And so overcoming that, that hypothesis, or, or rather that, that, that paradox, uh, 
one might speculate that traveling back in time and killing your grandfather, you enter a different sort of a sort of a reality, a different sort of a time frame than the time frame from which you came from. And in doing so, you might still exist because you have traveled back in time and into a sort of another reality. This is looking at time travel within the con- context of the general multiverse idea. Right. So, yeah, that, that in essence is what the grandfather paradox is, which is funny because there have been, uh, I think, a few solutions that have been proposed. And again, you've got to keep in mind these are all thought experiments anyway. And so I, I don't think people should get too hung up on, well, this one says this and therefore this could never happen. You know, I mean, they're all hypotheticals. Yeah. Last time I checked, we don't, we don't have that evidence that someone built a time machine. So it's really kind of needless to argue about whether someone could go back and murder their grandfather, let alone why they'd want to do that, knowing what the possible outcome would be. Um, but I, I, in my book, uh, The UFO Singularity, when I discussed certain what I call temporally evasive phenomena that we might be even observing in certain UFO reports, um, the folks at the Magonia blog – which interestingly borrows its name from Jacques Vallée, who they later, I think, began to differ more and more with in terms of their own ideology. They, they, they reviewed my book, and I appreciate that, but they said the author seems to have no knowledge of paradoxes that would prevent time travel, like the grandfather paradox. So I went and I commented on the article, and it said that the, the author of this uh, review seems to have no knowledge of the, um, you know, the, the fact that these paradoxes have been resolved in, in further thought experiments. And so, again, a lot of people will cite these these simple paradoxes and the thought experiments that they that they promote as as being the reality of time travel, which there is no such reality. And so we have to kind of, at least as we know today, we got to kind of start with the premise that it is just a premise and not get too hung up on these ideas. And it's funny how people get so closed-minded about things, but people, as I often people, say on my podcast, I digress. So. <laughs> people also love to, to, to find photos of, uh, of old photos and be like, look, it's a time traveler with a smartphone. And uh, that that seems to be a favorite pastime of people at this point, and it's usually fairly easy to debunk what we're seeing in those photographs. Some of the videos uh, are kind of interesting. They do look very much like a cell phone, but I would say that, and I think it's easily proven too, that in the majority of these videos, it's kind of like become, like you said, a thing. It's become a thing that people look through old videos and they try and find... Uh, rather than anachronisms in the sense that something old existing in the present day, although I think an anachronism goes both ways. It can be something that just exists out of its general placement in time or period. People like to look for things that appear modern in these old videos. And much like ancient alien theory, where we, we go back and we look at uh, you know the, the casing on the cover of a tomb that shows a man falling into the underworld in the ancient Maya culture, and it's interpreted as a man behind the you know the the advanced controls aboard a starship and he's taking off by our ancient alien theorists we have to be careful when we look at things from yesteryear and we project the standards of today onto those things because that always sets us up for a misunderstanding of what we're seeing in the past okay so building on that fundamental premise there are a number of things that have been mistaken for as being cell phones which have included notebooks early walkie-talkies that you know were in use and actually uh were, were actually being utilized in in factories and, and other kinds of areas uh, right around the time of the Second World War, maybe even beforehand, um, there were uh, what are called, I believe, is it an ear horn or an ear trumpet, which it was a, mm-hmm. uh, a, a, a basically a hearing aid that resembled a small trumpet that is placed up by one's ear, rather arcane kind of a hearing uh, amplifier uh, compared with the technologies that we have today, but they were nonetheless used at one time. And all of these kind of things, when they appear in films like the Charlie Chaplin uh, the circus film that showed a woman apparently walking down the street talking on a cell phone. You know, yeah, there are explanations for these kind of things. But you're right; it has become a thing where people like to kind of go, um, you know, digging around and see what kind of anachronisms that turn up. You never know. Maybe someone will find something outstanding at some point. But I also wonder, you know, depending on how far in the hypothetical future we are coming back, we may not recognize any technology we brought back with us. Yeah, it's a hypothetical too. You know, when it comes to how time travel might be created, you got to think. I mean, you know, the the universe is roughly maybe thirteen point five billion years old, I guess, and and somewhere throughout that time, you know, I'd written an article a few years ago talking about, and, and this is something that many modern astronomers acknowledge that long before Earth ever was a thing, there is a possibility that there were other galaxies and star systems that that formed that there were solar systems within these galaxies and that there were perhaps habitable planets that appeared in these solar systems. 
and that there was life that was able to exist long enough that they reached a level of technological sophistication and that by virtue of becoming technologically sophisticated, if they continued on unhindered and they didn't you know, succumb to mutually assured self-destruction, which some are saying we're going to do with Russia here in a couple of years, <laughs> let's hope not. Yeah. But it's looking an awful lot like it did a few decades ago, so a whole different discussion we could have. Um, hypothetically, long before there ever was an Earth, there could have been other advanced civilizations. And let's say that they came to the same fundamental determinations about uh, you know, life and space-time reality that we have today. Let's say that they made the same sorts of ob observations, and if these are indeed generic features of the way things work physically in the universe, uh, a relativity theory was already, rather than being created, it was discovered and kind of un unraveled from, from the ether, so to speak, as Einstein managed to do. And let's say these ancient, and yes, by definition, they would be aliens, so these ancient aliens, let's say that they got to a level of technological sophistication that far exceeded our own before they eventually were destroyed. Let's say that time travel was something that they were working on, too. Could time travel not merely be something from the future, but something that actually stems from the past? And the question is, is if a group had managed to create time travel at some point in the distant past and it did allow them to travel into the future, again, this is hypothetical, the question would be then, even if there eventually was a destruction of their civilization, were they ever really destroyed? I mean, because they suddenly have now kind of stepped out of the typical time frame of science. I, I'm seeing another thought experiment coming about here, and I, <laughs> you know, we'll, we'll save that for another discussion. But it does start to kind of warp your thoughts and bend your mind in, in strange ways when you begin to think about these kind of things. And when I talk about these sorts of things, people are like, oh, God, here he goes. Now he's talking about ancient aliens. you got to be very careful what kind of terms you use because I'll try and put – put out a, you know, just a hypothetical like this, and people will try and say, therefore, Micah thinks that ancient aliens do exist and that that's what UFOs are. You know, <laughs> not, not at all. I'm actually borrowing a popular term, and I'm, and I'm using it in a different way in a hypothetical scenario that might explain an alternate origin for time travelers, which would not be from the future. More advanced than us, but from the past, which is a, a, a kind of a, a, a way of framing the, the, the discussion that nobody seems to ever bring to the table. Uh, but we do have to consider that with the age of the universe, in likelihood that there were probably very vast technologies that have come and gone, and they had come and gone well before Earth ever arrived. It's a very interesting way of looking at it, because instead of expanding out into space, this culture might expand out into time. Yes, exactly, which is why I say that even if that, if that culture temporally ever was destroyed, you know, they were consumed by their star, or there was uh, some other cataclysm and they were destroyed, did they get off planet? But rather than getting off planet, they got out of the normal time cycle and therefore they exist indefinitely. Because hmm. at some point, I mean, although they are lost to us in this space-time frame, in, court, in, in, in accordance with our chronological understanding of time, they may yet show up a few years from now and have arrived at a certain temporal point and introduce themselves, and we're saying, wow, these are aliens. My gosh, we're finally meeting aliens. Where in the universe are you from? And they tell us the location, and we say, that's impossible. There's nothing there. And they say, what do you mean there's nothing there? Well, that's because they came from a time at which they still existed. So they may yet exist, and we haven't met them yet because they don't exist yet, and yet they have long <laughs> been gone. It's, it's, these are some of the interesting things with regard to the discussion about time travel as, as a hypothetical that come to mind. Um, you know, time travel is not a new concept, by the way, Soraya. Oh, uh, no. There, there's, a, there's a lot of reference made to it uh, that goes back even to ancient times. You know, in the uh, Indian epic, I've always had an affinity for the Vedas. The Mahabharata and the story of King uh, Kakud, I think it's Kakudmi is how it's pronounced, but he describes going to heaven to meet Brahma. And he returns to earth after going to heaven to meet Brahma, and he finds that many years have passed since he left, but he'd only been gone for a short amount of time. Now think about that, because as we hear scientists today talking about the reality of travel through space, they say if, if, if a body were traveling through space near the speed of light, and they travel around the universe, they may stay gone 20 years, but they'll come back and hundreds of years have passed on earth. Right. Okay, and that very sort of circumstance occurs in the Mahabharata where, again, King Kakudmi goes and speaks to Brahma. Uh, there are themes like this that show up um, in, in, in other areas of, of literature, although far more 
recently, like for instance, there was this idea of falling asleep and waking up many decades or century later that we see in a story called The Year 2440, A Dream If Ever There Were One by Louis Sebastian Mercier. In that story, the protagonist gets transported back to the year, or to, forward rather, to the year 2440. Um, we see a very, this sounds very similar, by the way, as some would have already noted to Rip Van Winkle, but that story actually predated it. We have uh, a story by H.G. Wells that was titled The Sleeper Awakes, where a man awakens 200 years in the future. You know, all these kind of things. But I mean, I, I think that the science fiction story that really put it all on, on the map was H.G. Wells' The Time Machine. Right. In which he actually posits that there could be a time machine that is capable of traveling backward in time. But funny thing is that there were stories before that that once again played with a similar idea. We had the Chronic Argonauts, a uh, less well-known story. Um, there was, let's see, a story titled The Clock That Went Backward by Edward Page Mitchell, which appeared in New York, uh, the New York Sun magazine in 1881. So those actually did uh, involve a time machine. Uh, and, and, you know, some even would say Charles Dickens' story, A Christmas Carol, is another literary reference that seems to involve temporal hmm. evasion, if you want to call it that. So, yeah, time, time travel has kind of been with us for a while, and there are a lot of different what we might call cultural predecessors to the modern idea that have appeared over the years. Um, earlier when you mentioned going back to the point where the time machine was started, what came to mind is the movie Primer. Primer. Um, yeah, do I have a copy of that right here? I think I do. Oh, funny enough, uh, my friend Sydney lo- uh, loaned that to me, and she said, oh, you got to watch this. <laughs> yeah. And I think it's on Netflix now as well for people who might want to watch this. It's a wonderfully made independent film about time travel and a couple of guys who attempted to do it, so yeah. And, and it, it's... it's uh... To me, it seems like somewhat realistic in the way they do it, uh, without getting into too many details when they tell the story. It, it has some sense of plausibility to it. Yeah, but then again, I think any good science fiction is going to really sell you on the idea by making it seem like something. Sure. That, well, even if it's not, <laughs> which again, based on really studying time travel, I mean, there are ideas about how a time travel machine might be built, but it seems almost impossible to do it. I mean, it would require, we can get into that here in a moment, exactly what physicists expect would allow for time travel, but it, it would be incredibly difficult to do. Uh, and, and so I wonder sometimes, even if it's something that can be done, would science ever, at least with our current understanding, and I think that the simple answer here is no, but I'll ask the question nonetheless, would science ever look at this and say, hmm, difficult though it may be, this is a practical thing for us to do because it may be beneficial, so let's do it. Time travel seems to be something that would be so difficult to attain that it is impractical and therefore in likelihood, at least for the longest time that I can see into the foreseeable future, won't be done. <laughs> hmm. Not to say that there wouldn't be people who would want to. It, it could be wrought with more problems than uh, advantages, really, depending on the whole paradox situation. Yeah, absolutely. So what does physics say about time travel? And, and haven't we moved electrons back in time at this point? Didn't we have one appear a fraction of a second before it was sent? I don't know about uh, electrons, but I think that there are hypothetical particles known as tachyons that are capable of traveling backward in time. Uh, there are uh, a variety of X-ray uh, that has been, uh, uh, under certain observational analyses, as, has, has appeared to have traveled faster than the speed of light, which is also considered the universal uh, speed limit of sorts. And that was stated by Einstein. So, I mean, I guess a good place to start would be to look at Einstein and what he thought about Again, we've already talked a good bit about him, but what he had basically said, you know, in a physical sense, we can observe that time is not only a reality, but something that can be measured in a relative sense. And that this has been verified, of course, as we know, through experiments that document, for instance, time dilation. Um, I think most people probably are at least familiar with that term, just for anyone in the audience who is not. The concept is, and see, we're we're talking about what science calls time, but I think it should be addressed, as we will try to get into in a moment, that there's something apart from the science time, okay? Scientists wouldn't agree with this, but but philosophers for, for centuries have talked about a different kind of time. And in fact, there was a famous debate between Einstein and Henri Bergen in which he had argued that the time that Einstein was referring to was not the same time that the philosophers study. And Einstein quipped, yes, but Henri, the time of the philosophers is now dead, which as open-minded as Einstein was about things, that that sentiment is very similar to the the kind of uh, you know antagonistic things that physicists say today about philosophy. And I dread to think that 
scientists get to a point where they think that we should now place limitations on thought because they don't those thoughts apparently according to the scientists keep up with the science itself there may be conceptual realities that are not things that can be physically observed or measured at, by scientists and i maintain that as i told a friend of mine on the telephone i said you know you and i are friends right and she said yeah and i said well i love you and she said well i love you too and i said now the reason i bring this to the table is because we can say that we share a love and that we're friends and that there's really good, strong, platonic friendship that we share. But can you measure that? Can a, science, a scientist observe that? We both agree that there is a love, a friendship, a bond between us. But, you know, so that to me would be an example of like a conceptual reality, not a measurable scientific quantity. Yeah. Um, and I yeah. do think it can be conceptual reality. So there's the conceptual kind of philosophical time. And then there's the science time. We'll start with that one. Um, Again, time dilation refers to the the passage of time differing as it relates to two points in space time and and of course uh, the gravity being exerted against objects in those spaces. Time dilation was predicted by Einstein. It was verified later. If we take two clocks and we and we synchronize those clocks, and every component within that clock is keeping perfect time, and these clocks remain perfectly synchronized. We leave them sitting there for a week. They're perfectly synchronized a week later. We leave them for two weeks. Two, three, four weeks later, they're still perfectly synchronized. But then we take one of those clocks, we put it on an aircraft, and we send that aircraft up, way up into low or near-Earth orbit, rather. And we send it around the Earth, traveling at incredibly fast speed, where it's moving fast through space, and the effect of the force of gravity emanating from Earth if you will, well, I want to be careful because I'm not trying to say gravity is a force per se. There's still some, you know, differing opinion on that. But let's, I think right. people understand what I'm saying here. Plane travels around the Earth, travels at extremely fast speed, comes back, and so this clock, being on that plane, has traveled at a fast speed, and it has been in a position by virtue of where it's traveled, its distance from the Earth, and the speed that it traveled, at which the effect gravity exerted on the clock different from that of the clock that remained on the ground. So they put them side by side, they're no longer synchronized. It's a minute difference, but there's a difference nonetheless. And the reason for the difference is because the effect of the passage of time on the clock that has traveled is different from the one that remains stationary. That, in an essence, in, in, a, in a simple explanation, is time dilation, and it verifies the sort of elastic nature of time that Einstein predicted. It is not this universal constant that so many had once thought it was. It is something that is directly affected by gravity and other forces in the universe, which is a fascinating concept. Now, by the same token, though, we could say that a philosopher might call time something that we use as a concept to relate to, well, where I am and how I orient myself in a period in my life. There are stories about people who when they suffer certain neurological disorders, will actually perceive time as slowing down around them. A person who is in grave danger seems to experience a kind of uh, slowing down of time, which is obviously something that's perceptual. But we have to ask, is human perception something that also is, is, is a quantity, we might say, that time could be measured by just like gravity? Um, I think most scientists would probably say no and that that all lies in neurological science, but nonetheless, the way that humans perceive time is interesting to me as well, even if it's not something that we can use as a universal standard for measuring it, okay? I hope that makes sense. So, but, uh, to me, again, there are two distinctly different interpretations of what time may be, and they aren't necessarily the same time, or <laughs> they aren't exactly the same type of time, we should say. Right. <laughs> so, um, so that's kind of what science says about time according to relativity theory you know a kind of time travel forward in time might indeed exist if we could can you know consider the effects of the passage of time on an object moving through space as we were kind of talking about but it makes the idea of traveling backward in time a lot more difficult because how backward time travel might be achieved again is expected to be very very difficult j richard god i mentioned him earlier he suggests time travel um very close to a hypothetical and highly pressurized region of space time called a cosmic ring could allow travel through time. If you don't know what a cosmic ring is, I would recommend Googling that. You can read about it. But he says it's, again, extremely impractical. He says the fact that numerous models, though, pertaining to travel backward and forward in time arise in relation to relativity theory. And I said this kind of toward the beginning of the interview. To J. Rod, uh, according to J. Richard Gott in his book about this, he says that seems to show that it is a generic component of the universe that Einstein envisioned, not just a hypothetical one that seems to you know, come from just one interpretation. So he says, in likelihood, time travel is possible, but 
again, this underscores everything we've talked about here. Whether it is something that could be accomplished practically is just a completely different story. Now, if you ever want to, we could talk about how a time machine might be built. Would you like to discuss Absolutely. that? Absolutely. Let's get into that. Okay. This is basically a four-step plan to building a time machine. <laughs> and this is pretty interesting, but this is the best way I can illustrate to you why I think it's so impractical. We would start with a collider, a device basically that uses a heavy ion accelerator used to boost the nuclei of atoms such as gold or uranium to colossal energies. Okay, And, and you know, colliders, I mean, are used these days for, for various different things. Uh, the super collider, you know, the Mass Hadron Collider in Geneva, Switzerland, is utilized for purpose of trying to create exotic states of matter that hypothetically are similar to what was at the beginning of the universe as we know it. And by studying these exotic states of matter in our ever-ending or never-ending search for the you know, Higgs boson and similar kinds of rare particles and things like this, we're trying to understand how the universe formed. And that's why we do this atom-smashing thing. But if we were to utilize a collider that smashes atoms into one another, you know, Paul Davies wrote about this in his book, How to Build a Time Machine, and he said, I have a quote here, the nuclei are confined by magnetic fields to a ring-shaped vacuum tube in which they are accelerated using electric pulses and arranged so that counter-rotating beams of nuclei are brought into high-speed contact. The collisions are designed to be so violent that they briefly recreate the conditions that prevailed in the universe about a microsecond after the Big Bang when the temperature was a searing 10 trillion degrees. This process, okay, and this is what's important. In this first step of our four-step time travel plan, colliding these atoms creates a plasma bubble, and this is called a quark-gluon plasma, okay? A spongy kind of a you know, particular plasma that occurs. Now, that quark-gluon plasma isn't capable of affecting you know, the space-time foam, so to speak, just yet. It has to be heated up to what are called Planck values. So that gets us into this, the second step of our plan here, Soraya. We need to get this quark-gluon plasma up to the Planck values, and that requires compressing pl the plasma bubble by a factor of about a billion billion. That's a lot of zeros. Hmm. <laughs> uh, one way of imploding the quark-gluon plasma bubble might be to employ explosive magnetic pinching. <laughs> and this is why I said that thermonuc uh, thermonuclear devices were required one way that this thermodynamic pinching might occur is if we were to take, imagine a series of devices that will ignite thermonuclear explosions, but in a spherical formation, in a circle, three-dimensional, all around this bubble, okay, so that these thermonuclear explosions are capable of blasting from every direction downward in a spherical formation against this quark-gluon bubble, which gets them to that billion-billion factor of Planck value. If we could do that, and you're starting to see at home, folks, why this seems increasingly impossible. If we could do that, uh, the intended result would produce a very tiny, highly concentrated ball of energy with a density that's roughly 10 trillion uh, kilograms per cubic centimeter, resulting in a little tiny black hole. I think another term for this would be a strangelet, but um, I may be wrong about that. Um, and, and some would say that this little tiny black hole that would result from this process could hypothetically be utilized as a wormhole of sorts for the time machine. So let's say that that works. We've got our little black hole that we're going to use as a wormhole for the formation in our time machine. The third step involves what's called an inflator. You have to take that little wormhole. We've got to widen it. Okay. One way we might do this would involve, you guessed it, anti-gravity, in which we would produce, um, you know, we would either take like exotic matter and we would have to insert that or inject it into this tiny wormhole. Anti-gravity might uh, be produced in a number of different ways, like negative energy. But see, one idea is that there may be an energetic source within the black hole itself that would cause a natural widening. I'll, I'll get to that in a moment. Uh, there's also what's called the Casimir effect, which I've always been interested in. Uh, basically, this occurs because if, if you take like two metal plates and you put them really close to one another. Have you ever heard of this before, Soraya? Yes. The Casimir, yeah, I figured, you know, it does come up sometimes in relation to, like, free energy discussions and UFOs mm -hmm. and things like this. But you take two plates, and you put them really close to one another. And um, it presents a limited amount of space for the formation of what are called virtual photons, which would hypothetically rebound off these metal plates. This tiny little space between these plates reduces the kinds of particles that can be present. And therefore, 
it slightly lowers the amount of energy that can exist. And in a space like this within a quantum vacuum that already has zero energy, the idea is that if you reduce the amount of particles that can exist in a tiny space within an area where there is zero energy, then you have to have something, which is what we call negative energy. So the Casimir effect, strange that the sounds, has actually been confirmed in the lab. Okay, Although not really in a way that really produces any kind of measurable negative energy, but it's a hypothetical reality, and it's, it's certainly been observed. So if we were to utilize something like that, there are other ways we could do this, too. One, one that uh, Paul Davies has outlined, again, coming back to his book, he talks about using a series of lasers fired through crystals that squeeze light by rearranging the photons into a uh, into pairs, okay? And then what would happen is the, the beam would bounce off of, of a reflective surface at an angle, splitting little bursts of positive and negative energy, and then what you do is you'd siphon off the negative energy and once again, that would go into the black hole. But however you choose to do it, the idea is that you'd use negative energy to expand the wormhole. But because a wormhole has its own extremely strong gravitational field, some uh, people have, you know, some scientists have suggested that there is maybe a kind of a quantum vacuum within the wormhole itself that might expand spontaneously to an extent. It would actually draw in negative energy spontaneously. So... That's the third and probably the most complex step. The final step would just be to create a permanent differential between the two openings of the wormhole. This is what they call a differentiator. And what that does is basically it takes the wormhole and stretches it, Soraya. Hmm. And you stretch this wormhole, and when you're stretching the wormhole, what actually happens is the two openings exist in different points in time. Okay? It would require a very short distance, but a wide enough opening to allow an individual to step through that wormhole and into this other fixed point of time, which might be a decade into the future. Now, that's why, according to this model, you know, this, this wormhole might allow someone to step right into 10 years from now. But because of the way that this time machine works, the time travelers from the future would also be able to step back through it, but they couldn't go further back in time than the point at which this time machine was created. Because that's where the the point of origin for this wormhole machine that we've built exists. So that's why the time travelers might not be here yet, because we haven't yet built the time traveling machine. Hmm. So, so that's, it's, it's yeah. kind of like just creating a, a wormhole through time. Exactly, which is, I hope I outlined here for you, it would be much more difficult to do than I think, you know, <laughs> it would be practical for us to attempt, So at least for now. Right, right. But who knows what we'll discover tomorrow that might make something like that more practical. And, I mean, again, that may happen. That very well may happen. So, But I, I'm, I'm fascinated with this whole idea about time. I mean, there's so many different directions that we could go in terms of you know, what this involves. I know we've talked on a lot of them, including the urban legends about different people, time travelers. You know, there's the John Teeter story, which I don't put a whole lot of stock in. Um, but it is an interesting concept that at some point, maybe time travel will become a reality, or at some point in the future it already has, and maybe they've overcome the kinds of hurdles that we've outlined with our hypothetical four-step time machine building process here, and they may be able to get back to our you know, reality. And, and, and the question would be, would we recognize those time travelers? Again, someone brought up to me something you and I have talked about in the past, and it's been cited numerous times, innumerable, innumerable times probably, and that is Clark's Third Law. Any sufficiently advanced technology seen by a lesser advanced civilization uh, or group of technological thinkers might be perceived as magic. Um, so when we think about strange phenomena, we think about weird things that seem to defy explanation, I do at least give some thought to the idea that we may be perceiving things that are just far more advanced and perhaps because they are from outside our space-time reality that we recognize as the present. I mean, it is at least possible. Sure, sure. Well, anything's possible. Um, yeah, whether it's probable, that's another question. <laughs> exactly. Um, so now, now let's look at time from, from more of a consciousness standpoint. Would it be possible, and is it possible, to travel in time using your consciousness? That's a cool question. Okay, I'm, I'm glad you brought that up because there is some anecdotal evidence that again, I mean, this kind of gets more into the, the realm of mysticism. We've been dealing with some pretty heavy science here in this first portion, so now looking ahead to the, the consciousness angle of this, I mean, maybe so. Um, you know, there's some data that suggests that perception of time, again, can be altered, and that kind of comes back to something I was talking about earlier. Uh, there's the neurobiological approach, 
and yes, as I kind of favor personally the philosophical question about time, in neurobiology it has a lot to do with the brain, you know, and how we learn and everything, but human perception of time as studied through philosophy are, are kind of involves this argument of whether time really exists at all. And some would still maintain that really all of the stuff, we call it time, you know, the passage of, again, well, it's kind of difficult to phrase this because, I mean, we're so used to watching a clock and living by this idea of chronology. But what if really there is no time? Right. See, this, this kind of remains a, a valid question among philosophers that what if all things just are? And what if we perceive as chronology is more a, 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 a kind of an artifact of the way we have evolved to orient ourselves with our, with our environment? Um, that, that is at least a possibility and that time could be something that is more conceptual and more rooted in our, in our minds, which again, I would draw a distinction between that and the observable effects of time dilation. But at some point, I guess it comes down to this notion that we have to use two different terms for what maybe are mistaken for being the same phenomena. Um, now let's, let's get real weird for a minute, you know, because I think that's really where you were kind of going more with your question. I mean, could one leave their body and travel astrally to the future or something like that? I mean, right, I don't right. I don't know, but I mean, Soraya psychics claim that they do that in essence. Right. Don't. Yeah, and and you know, and this the thing about, for instance, when Stephen Hawking talked about um, the thermodynamic arrow of time and the way that it affects memory. Again, the, the ba very basic premise here is that the mind works. Okay, and he was addressing the question: Why do we remember the past? I mean, you and I can remember things that we were talking about ten minutes ago. Uh, neither of us, to my knowledge, are actively participating in a psychic experiment where we're predicting what we're going to talk about in, you know, four minutes from now. <laughs> we could make that prediction, but, I mean, we don't know exactly where the conversation, where the road will go. <laughs> so, <laughs> so what Hawking was trying to address is obviously something about the mind functions within the context of, well, we can remember, but we can't remember the future. What prevents a memory from the future? And his logic was that there, the, the mind works in the same order in which, or the same direction, I suppose, in which entropy increases. And that I can sit down, and the example he uses, I can read a book, and I can remember all this, and I can create a lot of order in the universe by reading the book and remembering and the data and storing that information in my mind. But the food I have to eat, the water I have to drink, the sleep I have to read in between you know, periods of reading, there's a lot of energy that's expended in order to be able to create this order in the universe. And there's always more energy expended than there is order created in the universe. Always. Always. And this is what the thermodynamic uh, laws entail. We'll never be able to put less energy in and get more information out. That's not right. the way the universe works. It's not. And so, according to Hawking, there is this thermodynamic arrow of time. And we perceive the past because we remember, our, i.e., our minds function in the same uh, direction, where we perceive, rather, reality in the same direction in which or, uh, entropy increases in that way. So I began thinking, I was like, well, okay, then what are psychic visions? If there are more legitimate ones, and I think that there are some instances throughout time where people have experienced these things, could these be little hiccups in you know, the thermodynamic uh, uh, structure of the universe? Uh, are thermodynamics not always what they appear to be? Can there be temporary breakdowns in thermodynamic laws? It, you know, kind of got me thinking. And um, uh, the, I think it was Erwin Schrodinger who proposed the idea back in the 20s or 30s of neg entropy in which a life form on a planet that may have, uh, you know, a, a, it's a small enough planet that there's less gravity exerted and thus the energy required to be exerted by a small you know, microbial life form uh, might be such in relation to the gravitational exertion and other factors that this this hypothetical alien life form, small though it is, could exist almost in a way that is like perfectly efficient, I guess, would be the term, hmm. in such that there is an equal amount of order created as there is energy exerted, and that these little creatures could be essentially negentropic. I think that was the term that he used for that. So could thought or could memory at any time under any circumstances overcome the thermodynamic arrow of time? Um, with artificial intelligence in the future, we're working toward, you know, microcomputational components that will be near, if not perfectly efficient. If we had an advanced artificial intelligence whose, you know, mechanical brain was devised from perfectly efficient machines that functioned in a way that, you know, entropy was overcome, or at very least kind of canceled out, would said artificial intelligence be capable of perceiving space-time 
in more of a past, present, and future, rather than you and I can say, I'm sitting right here, but I can remember the past, could AI remember the future also? Will AI be able to predict the future because of the way that the artificial mind functions in relation to entropy? I mean, these are questions that I think should and could be asked, and that in a few years may become a reality. So it's kind of interesting. But yeah, I, I wonder sometimes if one is capable of, of leaving the body, let's talk about like something like astral projection. There are you know stories of people leaving the body and dreams and things like this. Um, again, if you are no longer hindered by a physical body in which entropy is a thing, as a factor, uh, could an astral body be capable of traveling not only around the world in the immediate sense of reality, but also through the past and into the, into the future? I mean... So sure, in terms of consciousness, I, I can't help but think that there is some sort of a component with consciousness as, as it relates to time and perception of it, too. So I think that's actually a really great question. Hmm. Um, now, there were experiments done at uh, Cornell, not far from here, where they were uh, showing people images and were watching for their reactions. And for a, it, it was basically billed as pornography proves psychic ability, I believe is what the headlines were. Because when they would show them sexually stimulating images, their brains would actually react a split second before the image was shown. Yeah, that was Daryl Bim who carried out that study. And um, I think he called it uh, formally or informally feeling the future. I'll, I'll tell you why I found that one really interesting. I've, I've got a lot of friends who don't buy into the sort of junk that you and I talk about on our podcasts, okay? And a good example of this is my dear friend Charles Wood, who is the banjo player in my in my bluegrass group, we travel around a lot. And, um, you know, one night we were walking outside of a, of a venue and it was beautiful. Mars and, and Saturn were both visible in the sky. And I said, Charles, look, there's, there's Mars. And if you look to the right, you can see Saturn. He wouldn't even look up. And I said, Charles, you're not looking. And he said, Micah, I pay attention to things that are happening on earth. <laughs> and you know, that is a practical mindset that I think in truth, a lot of people are in these days, but I would dare say that the listeners of, of your show are probably not those of such a mind. I bring that up here because Charles, I want to really drive home the point that he's not the kind of guy who really cares about those kinds of things. And I asked him one time, I just had a, cause I, I, I kind of like to tease him and try and push him out of his comfort zone. And I said one night we were after, uh, after a show, we were sitting and having a Guinness one night and I said, Charles, um, have you ever had what you'd call a psychic prediction? He said, oh, yeah. Oh, yeah, absolutely. I'm thinking, what? So he punked me with his re his response to my trying to punk him. And I said, well, well, what happened? And he said, every girl I've ever dated that I actually ended up dating, the moment I saw them, I knew I was going to date them. Hmm. And I'm like, uh, okay. Well, but then I got to thinking about that in relation to the study that you just brought up, Soraya. And I started thinking, what if a momentary kind of a precognitive sense when there is a, a, you know, a connection that you make with someone that you just, you really, I, I don't know. I mean, again, we can say pheromones, we can say any number of different things, but I think what we all agree upon is that no matter how much we apply biology or neuroscience to the, the factors that a person finds attractive about another individual. I mean, you know, you hear this expression, for instance, well, he or she is just my type, right? Mm -hmm. I've got a type. I mean, I, I know there's, well, I have several types. I mean, you know, of different qualities and a lady that I find particularly attractive, but I don't just have one. I think that there are different combinations of things about a, a about a, you know, a woman that I would find attractive. And so I found it, and, and these days it's becoming all the more common that, I mean, you know, you hear this term pansexuality. A lot of people are much more comfortable just saying, I'm not attracted to a specific gender or anything. It's just there, there are certain things that when the combination is there, it doesn't matter, man or woman, you know, whatever. So, you know, to each his own or her own. But the point is, is that we obviously don't really have a full picture on what exactly it is that to any one individual they're going to find attractive. And I wondered, could there not have been some sort of an evolutionary advantage that would be given to an individual if they are momentarily capable of having an almost precognitive um perception or, or, you know, I don't know what you would call it, but just some sort of a sense that this is going to be a person who will, for breeding purposes or whatever else, uh, be mate worthy, which I think is essentially what they were getting at with this study. And it's not a surprise to me because, again, why would that be useful? Why would that be beneficial? Well, because, of course, the furtherance of the species relies on coupling. And so if an evolutionary advantage is given to a couple that is capable of increasing their chances of, of procreating by virtue of some sort of a something that that 
borders on precognition or maybe actually outright relies on it. I'm not surprised that a study like Daryl Bims might suggest, although the you know repeatable, I guess the repeatability of that that study could be questioned because many suggested that not only was it not really reliably repeatable, but also that the statistics that he said were significant, according to some, are less than significant. But hmm. again, you know they're, they're, that that argument exists with all things in science for the most part, at least up to a point. But if indeed the the observational data from that study is is legitimate. It, it does seem to suggest that, yeah, people, when reacting to something that seems to be connected with uh, coupling and with procreation, that, yeah, they absolutely uh, kind of anticipate it before it happens. So I've wondered if there isn't some sort of a connection between, again, the breakdown in the thermodynamic arrow of time as it relates to what we find attractive and what is more likely to ensure procreation. <laughs> hmm. It doesn't seem like a crazy concept to me. It just may be something about evolution that, once again, we don't yet quite fully understand. And if that is true, though, what does it say about the nature of time? Well, exactly. I mean, because if it suggests that some aspect of the future is capable of being gleaned from the present, I mean, we could say that about psychic you know, phenomena in general. What it seems to suggest is what many physicists maintain, which is that the future already exists, but we can't perceive it, which comes back to this question about predetermination and fate and all these kind of things. You know, nobody's going to tell me that my future is already written and that I can't do anything to change it. I mean, but we don't know. I mean, you know, there is this notion that, I mean, time is just a thing and that we just happen to be kind of in the act of experiencing it. Um, there, there have been times where I've been driving down the road and I think there's nothing stopping me from just turning this car and driving right into that tree. And yet you never did, did you? Right. Of course not, because I don't want to drive into a tree. But, you know, I think to myself, could I? I mean, like, if I really wanted to, or is it just not something that's supposed to happen? That's a weird thing. I mean, see, the, the, this is why I say often on my shows that the, the most important things that we can observe and experience in reality are not obvious. And, and I think that the most fascinating things are not always you know, things that you walk outside and you just expect to see sitting in your yard. I mean, you have to think very carefully about seemingly everyday, mundane, repetitious things. And 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 then you begin to go, why didn't I drive into that tree? Damn, where did the road go? <laughs> and I mean, you know, I'm serious. You have to really stop and really think deeply about things that are most easily overlooked because they're so innate to the everyday existence that we live that they are considered mundane or they aren't even considered at all. As soon as we stop and consider those which those things which we don't consider, that's where we'll find, I think, the new keys to understanding reality. Because obviously this is not a complete picture. That should be obvious by now. And any scientist who would try to say, well, we're 99.999% here, yeah. but tell that to a mathematician. <laughs> <laughs> um, see, now, in, in, in for me, I have always had dreams prior to meeting people of people who will be important to me. Really? Like, Give me an example. Uh, I don't really want to do that. <laughs> it's usually very personal stuff. I understand. But, but I'll get pieces. Like, I've gotten to the point where I can recognize the pieces because they're they're draped in dream imagery. And I'll write down the pieces. And I'll be like, okay, so this person's going to show up at some point. And then they do. And sometimes it's six months later. I've had dreams about people six or seven years before I met them. I didn't even realize until I started going through old dreams and went, well, son of a bitch. <laughs> Yeah, I had a dream like that, which I talked about on my show recently, where a woman, she was red-haired, um, you know, maybe shoulder length. Um, she she showed up at an event that I was doing and was just one of those people that's like, hey, you're Micah Hanks. And I mean, and that happens a lot when I go to events. People are like, yo, and, you know, companions, great. And we end up traveling. I was re recently on this Ancient Mysteries cruise, and, like, everybody on the cruise was like that. It was like, you know, hey, we're in the middle of the jungle. What else are we going to do? Let's go follow Micah. He's getting lost. He's he's climbing up a tree over there, and we have these amazing adventures, or we'll just go bowling that night and hang out. And So, you know, it's it's cool, I guess, when you're like, you know, when when you do what we do and, and people be, you know, begin to kind of get to a point where they know who you are and and therefore they're attracted to you. And so that, that happens a lot. But in the stream, I had this dream that this uh, young lady comes up, you know, a few years younger than me, I guess, you know, but close to my age. And uh, she um, introduces herself and says, it wasn't so much an introduction as it was, hey, I'm Sarah, come on. And uh, and so I remember we, we got in a car and we were driving somewhere in relation to this event, but and it's just this crazy adventure ensues within this dream. And I wake up thinking, gosh, where did she go? And it's not, <laughs> it's not where did she go. It's 
when will she be? I mean, and, or if, I mean, you know, it's, it's funny. I've had this happen an awful lot where I meet people in dreams that are just as real to me in the dream as you or I, and they tell me their name. I, which, I mean, really, even if we don't look at this as being something that's precognitive or psychic, because I have no evidence of that, and I don't typically, as you're describing, that's why I was asking, but maybe we could talk at some point off the mic about that if you want. But, um, you know, I, I can't tell you a time where I, I will say this, though, actually, funny thing, after the Sarah dream, I did meet a girl a few nights later uh, after a show who was just giggling and just came over, and, and uh, I said, what, what, what's your name? She says, I'm Sarah. And I said, of course, you're Sarah. <laughs> and, uh, um but I will admit that she also didn't resemble the woman who I met in the dream whose name was Sarah. But that's um, you know, maybe the closest I could say. But uh, I definitely have had some dreams that seemed borderline very premonitory. Another example was there was a group I helped out for a while years ago called Milestone. And I was supposed to go uh, in a dream I had just a few months ago. I dreamt that this group was getting back together and they couldn't find their singer, Justin, a good friend of mine from, of many years. And uh, I wake up the next day and I get a text from Dakota Waddell, who uh, is the bass player in my band and sits in on my podcast from time to time, too. And he said, you're not going to believe who I got a text message from. He says, Milestone, they're getting back together, but Justin's not going to be the singer this time. Hmm. And I was like, well, that's funny. I had a dream about this, Dakota, and he just didn't respond to the text. I mean, and I, you know, <laughs> that's typically the response when I tell somebody, well, I think I just had another one of these weird synchronicities happen. I don't expect my friends to go, wow, another one. My friends are kind of like, okay, Micah, great. He's going meta again, run. <laughs> you know? But it's funny because my friends might act that way. My mother, I think, is very accepting of the weirdness. Uh, my good friend Tiffany Mack is extremely accepting of the weirdness because she has it happen all the time too. Um, and the listenership of shows like yours and mine. I get emails from people all over the world, and that's what's so great to me about technology, Soraya, is without technology, you and I wouldn't know each other. No. I mean, we met, we've, we've never met though. We've never actually, we've never even had a video chat, which is kind of refreshing only because I say that everybody, you know, they get on Skype and stuff, but there's something that's unique about a voice to voice conversation. You know what I mean? Absolutely. Yeah, I figured you would. Yeah. It's like a podcasting thing. There's something about not having to have the picture in the equation. I mean, that's what's I think appealing about podcasts to an extent. And yeah, and you, you and I've never literally never seen each other. We've seen pictures of each other. Yeah, that's it. But our entire relationship is based on technology, and yet the relationship I have with people who I have met through things like the World Wide Web, it's the only way I'm able to connect with people that I have similar experiences and worldviews about this weirdness with. Yeah. It's weird? And and if you go back, I mean, sure, there was, there was Coast to Coast and stuff in the 90s, but it was hard if you weren't at a big station like that to even do the interviews that we do now. Oh, yeah. Because oh, yeah. now, now you can use Skype and talk to anyone in the world. Isn't it crazy? Yeah, think about that. Back in the, in the, in the day of Coast to Coast AM, you see with talk radio, the way it began was the DJs. There was a DJ. It was um, I actually wrote about this in, in the book that I wrote about podcasting. I, you know, I think you knew about that. I wrote a book called mm -hmm. The Guide to Maverick Podcasting. And I, throughout the book, tried to pepper it with you know little stories and little side notes and little bits of history about you know the history of what you're learning how to do with this book, which makes it much more interesting to me. And a lot of Star Wars and Doctor Who references and fun stuff like that too. But <laughs> the early days of talk radio came from, and I'm trying to remember the big bill something. He, he was, he was a, uh, uh, I think it was a Chicago based DJ. And he decided one night it might be cool to get one of his favorite band leaders on his show. And so what he did is he calls him on the phone and just holds the mic. Like I'm holding my cell phone right now, right next to the, to the microphone so that the audience could hear him talking. And people just loved being able to hear this interview taking place over the, the radio. And so that led to the creation of a device called a telephone hybrid. I've got one right here, but I seldom use it because I don't do a lot of call-ins on my show, but I might use it for interviews from time to time. And uh, a telephone hybrid basically reduces the crosstalk and allows you to split a phone signal with the caller and, and, the, and, the, the, and the, uh, the sender, whatever you want to call it. And you can, for instance, I can use my microphone and I can plug it into one channel on my board and then I can take a channel out of the back of the call hybrid and go into my board and I can split the channels and, you know, we can still hear, hear each other, but we've got separate audio signals. And that allowed interviews where people could pot a phone line into a board in a radio station and people could do, uh, do the call-in thing. And it was a slow progression over time that led to the popular talk radio interview format that we have. And in, think about that. 
back in the day of Art Bell starting Coast to Coast AM in the 90s, I mean, that was the best that technology could afford us. And now we've got Skype, a free program, free, let me say, that if you've got a decent computer or a smartphone, you can download it and you can use Skype the same way a phone hybrid works. You can split the, the outgoing and the incoming audio, run it through a board, as, as I do, as you do. We can pr- produce podcasts with a free program. An audio hybrid still costs, a, a phone hybrid rather, they still cost several hundred dollars, even the cheap ones. And it's just incredible because technology is really turning things upside down. And yeah, back in the day you had to use long distance phone calls and all this. No, yeah. Skype, you can call anybody, anywhere, as long as they got a Skype account. I can talk to to you know, uh, you know Joe Paduck over in Russia, sitting a block away from the Kremlin. I can call, you know, Ying over in in uh, the 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 whatever province of China. I can call Tom in the UK. I can call whoever. And yeah, it's it's incredible. But that is why I love it because technology. Even though I have days of the week, you know, Soraya, where I complain about you know people walking down the street and staring at their phones instead of the sure. splendor of nature around them. There is that aspect of this that connects me with people like you and people who will listen to this interview and they'll write to me and they'll say, God, Mike, did you just, would you ever shut up? <laughs> <laughs> and I mean, I'm able to have these interactions with people as a result of this technology. And they use email to do that. Back in the yeah. old days, we had to sit down and write a letter. <laughs> I mean, there, 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 there is something to be said of the old way of doing things because it took a little more focus, a little more effort. Um but it, it it's it's its own pro and con at the same time because you can do so much more now, but it doesn't take the same dedication to do it. Don't you think, Soraya, that as a result of the kinds of interviews and the kinds of concepts and things that we discuss on shows like this, that you, after a while, kind of become a culturist? How so? In the sense that when you talk with people about such a variety of different things and you begin to spot these weird little trends in human culture and how they relate to and are changing our lives on a daily basis. I mean, to me, I feel kind of like, yeah, it's like more than a expert on this or a person who's interested in that. I mean, it's like we're commentators on culture. Granted, True. we might focus on those weird aspects of culture like the unexplained, but I mean, it's culture nonetheless, isn't it? That That is true. It's unexplained culture. <laughs> Yeah, but then again, I mean, one might argue from a certain perspective that all culture is unexplained. Fair enough. <laughs> uh, so what do you have coming up? Next week, I am going to Charleston, South Carolina. Um, I'm going to meet up with my good pal Jason Pentrail, who I move. We should, I'm putting forth a motion. We need to get him as a guest on your show because all right. you would really enjoy talking with Jason Pentrail. Great guy, which is why I'm going to go down to Charleston with him. Next week, uh, I don't gen- generally have time to devote a week um, to doing anything, let alone uh, you know carving it out of my schedule and doing it with somebody else. But he's a very bright fellow, and we're going to be doing some research on a number of things. We're going to be going and uh, talking with an archaeologist uh, who is now semi-retired with the uh, uh, University of South Carolina with particular interest in an ancient Clovis-era site, which is in Allendale County, South Carolina. It's called the Topper Site. And the topper site, you, you, this may have actually come up in conversation with people like Randall Carlson when you've had him on your show in the past. Um, the topper site is an, an old site in the sense that the Clovis were, of course, the first people believed to have settled, you know, migrated into and settled America. This is believed to date back to around, you know, 13.5 thousand years ago or so. But radiocarbon dating at the topper site not only suggests that it is much older anywhere from 20 to maybe as much as, and this is on the far side of things, but as much as 50,000 years, hmm. which, as you can see, gets into that idea of, well, was there something going on much earlier than general you know, archaeology and history tells us? But it also begs the question, uh, well, a number of questions. Uh, <laughs> well, actually, before I get to that, I'll say that there are certain other anomalies about the Topper site that I've uh, learned about uh, recently that I want to talk with Dr. Goodyear, who we're going to be speaking with about, so it begs all these questions again, you know, first of all, what, what do we know about the ancient world and, and the settlement of this country, North America and South America for that matter? Uh, and, and how does this relate to things like, uh, for instance, the uh, Younger Dryas impact hypothesis, which posits that there was some sort of a cataclysm that occurred, which resulted in a sudden heating and a, uh, a, a lessening of the glacial period that occurred during that time. 
so that's one thing we're digging into. We're also going to be doing some secret societal research. You know, that's a favorite subject of mine. Uh, the health mm-hmm. club used to have meetings in Charleston. It's one of the oldest American cities. It wasn't destroyed during the Civil War. Uh, it did, a large portion of it did burn a number of years later, but it is largely preserved. The oldest Scottish Rite temple in the country is there. And so Jason, whose background is actually environmental science, but he and I are going to be uh, getting together with some friends of ours, uh, Mark and Rebel Jones, who are historians in the area. Mark and I meet for a Guinness every time I'm in Charleston. And we're going to do a Graylian meetup, I think, on Thursday night. So a lot of Graylian listeners hopefully will come out for that and we'll hang out in the tavern and talk about all these kind of things. So yeah, secret societies, ancient history, and uh, more recent history, too, is the kind of modus operandi, and we're going to be getting into all that. And then, my friend, apart from that, I have nothing on the books right now. I have no conferences booked. Uh, well, that's not true. I, I'm looking far enough ahead. I've got some stuff next summer, but yeah, in the, in the immediate sense, I have no conferences booked, uh, and I'm kind of thankful for that because I'm, I want to take a little time here over the next few months to kind of after this year, it was so crazy, so many events and so much traveling. I always love to travel, but I want to kind of slow down, dig in, do some of the, 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 the nerdier side of the research, which is less running around and romping and traveling and journeying and meeting and dining and enjoying and flying. And it's keep your nose in the book and study and take notes. And uh, so that's that's what's going to ensue for the next few uh, few months. So so that's what is going to be happening in the world of Micah Hanks and maybe a new book or two. Nice. Or two. Yeah, because I can never pick just one subject. As we were talking about, ladies and gentlemen, before we went to air, Soraya said, you know, aren't you working on a book about time travel? And I said, well, there will be one in the works, but there's also, you know, a lot of other subjects. Let me just say that. Uh, there, there are a lot of other <laughs> subjects I want to try and dig into. And, you know, I'm a student of life, and, and, I'm, a, and I'm a dedicated amateur, and I'm not someone who has an actual degree, although I have had some time in college and some, you know, rudimentary scientific training, but of, uh, I think in the sense of, um, you know, self-learning and teaching oneself things, I am uh, a person who is a, a dedicated uh, amateur, uh, but I'm dedicated to an awful lot of things, and I'm fascinated by every one of them, and I want to learn as much as I possibly can. Nice. Autodidactic, can... I guess, is the word. Autodidactic, yeah. Yes. And people can find you on the Grillian Report every week. Yeah, greatlyreport.com, and you can also head over to my website, micahanks.com, and all my information is there. Hey, follow me at Micah Hanks on Twitter. Easy to do and fun. Why not? <laughs> all right. Thank you so much, Micah.